six years, seven years. Um, and so, you know, we started out with something like undo DB, which was, I think, a Linux C, C++ reverse debugger, like essentially just hooked into GDB, um, no front end, no, uh, um, nothing particularly sophisticated, though we, we're getting a little bit more sophisticated and we sort of started selling that. And I think we sort of realized that um, it was a sort of, I wouldn't say a hard sell into developers. Every evangelist developer gets it. Um, but trying to get an entire corporation on board or something in a sort of it has been really hard work. Um, and so I think we've kind of evolved it. We've developed a kind of what we call live recorder, which yeah. takes the reverse debugging technology, but lets you write out the file to disk. So you can go and take it away and yeah. go and do kind of omniscient debugging after the event. Um, and various other things like playing with thread fuzzing. Our technology is currently serialized. So that's generally a downside, but uh, it gives you the upside of you can actually, we can actually mess with how we serialize our customers or uh, any process we're attached to threads. Uh, and that definitely helps with um, kind of certainly identifying race conditions. Um, I'm sure there's all sorts of other stuff we've done with it. Stuart, anything else that I've sort of obviously cool. missed as a summary? Well, that no, is that pretty damn cool. Yeah, it's pretty much, yeah, I think you've pretty much covered everything there. Um, um, this is so, you know, your your company is undo.io exactly yeah yeah absolutely um, and I think as of um, as of about I don't know probably three weeks ago we, we've got a free trial up there which um, are you guys familiar with RR um, record I, I think it, it's um, it's an old Mozilla project um, so that's a really interesting similar ish open source project um, I say both of those, I would say, like, go take a look at. Um, they're both really, really great. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the R developers, by the way. Hi, my name's Kyle Huey. Hey, Kyle. Uh, Robert, Robert O'Callaghan forwarded me the invite to this meeting, so I thought I'd drop in and say hi to you guys. Awesome. Great. Welcome, Thank Kyle. You. We're happy to have you. That is so cool. Um, we were just starting to go around and talk a little bit about what we were doing. Would you like to hop in and take the next shot? Tell us what you're, you're up to and all of that. I'm sure I could do that. So uh, I don't know if Robert's going to show up. He he said he was, but I don't see him yet. Uh, my name is Kyle Huey. I worked at Mozilla for six or seven years. Honestly, I can't really remember. Um, and one of the things that we did there um, towards the end in my case was we built a low overhead open source free software record and replay tool for user space Linux programs. And so it essentially records at sort of the user space kernel boundary. It records all syscall inputs, uh, context switches, that kind of stuff, and then plays it back deterministically. And then during replay, it fakes the GDB server. So you could just debug in GDB. And GDB, some brave soul added reverse debugging support to it. Um, and it just the thing that's built into GDB, it essentially single steps the program and records a log of what every instruction did. Uh, which is really terrible implementation wise, but this person did all of the UI work for us. And then we were able to just substitute in our much better implementation. Uh, and so you can, you can just reverse the GDP and it's great. Uh, since Robert and I left Mozilla, since Robert and I left Mozilla, we've been working on um, a new, we've been working on a little startup with a new omniscient debugging tool kind of thing, which takes our trace um, and extracts a ton of information and, and gives you sort of an omniscient debugging experience for C++. Uh, so yeah, that's what I do. That's pretty cool, man. I, I thought about C++ and the issues involved and I just like freaked out. I said, no, no, Java, the JVM, instrumenting bytecodes is so easy. Uh, it basically, I, I actually had um, done a little mock-up of this I had thought about this for years. Wouldn't it be a great thing? And then one day I said, I'm unemployed. I'm just going to do a little mock-up. I wrote a little bit of Java code where I put the mm -hmm. right into the Java code. So it would just record stuff and say, okay, is the interface interesting? And once I decided that it was interesting, then I was talking to a friend of mine and he said, oh, well, instrument the JVM. And I... I'm embarrassed to say I didn't right. even know what it was. And then I picked up the book 
which was written <laughs> by my um, erstwhile housemate, Frank Yellen. He and I lived together for several years. So, <laughs> but it took me about a month to get it working for the first time. It was so easy. Uh, anyway, um, that was back in uh, 2001. I am recording this, by the way, and I will share it with everybody. And I'll also uh, make sure that the chat gets shared with everybody. Um, Jens or Jens, uh, I don't know how you pronounce your name. Would you like to tell us what you're up to? Yeah, it's Jens. Hello, good morning. I, I'm, I'm currently in Japan and continue my work on, on, on HLS, so high, high level synthesis. When I was first talking with you, Bill, I, I was working on, on, my, on my own HLS tool because at that time there was no really good commercial tools available. So now I, I'm working here, here at, at Weekend at, at, at Fugaku Super, Supercomputer and we are trying to, to incorporate HLS there to integrate FPGAs into the supercomputer. So I, I used the Omni, OmniSend debugger for, for debugging my, my, my own compiler, which at that time was written completely in, in Java, but now we are having a strange thing where it's using the LLVM as, as a front end and, and the back end is written in Java. So we are using the, the Java native interface, which is, was really a bitch, still a bitch. And we are I, I planning to some, sometimes to port everything to C, to C++ if, I, if I'm gonna continue with that, because I know I'm trying playing around with Intel HLS and there. The commercial tools quite catched up to what the, the ac ac academic tools could do, and they are much more. They, in, in what they can do, there they're much better. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying, and yep. yes, oh god, the native interface. I have written a little bit of code with that. I was working on uh, uh, multi-threaded debugging and multi-threaded work when I was in Sun in the '90s. So. Ooh, that was interesting. Um, Ryan, I, we can see your pretty face and you have horns coming out of your head. Are you part reindeer? No, <laughs> no there's just some decorations. Don't be afraid. <laughs> so um, obviously I had seen your, your project a while ago. And I, I was talking with some collaborators at uh, WPI here in, in Worcester, Mass. Um, and we had wanted to do something like an omniscient debugger, but you know, we were too busy or or we didn't know enough or something. But in, in the interim, I've learned enough about the JVM bytecode to be dangerous. Not not that I really know what I'm doing, but um, I can get somewhere. So I, I was working on my own implementation of the uh, omniscient debugger, which I'll send a link to in, ch in, in chat, using like modern tools. So I've, you know, I've read through your code and it's um, a little dated. So <laughs> I wanted to try to reimagine it with modern, uh, modern stack. Um, you know, most importantly, modern bytecode manipulation. Because uh, I, I think that, that was the most painful part of reading through um, oh, oh. Your that implementation. Was really painful. You are correct. Oh my God. Yeah. So so now I'm using um, I think it's called ASM. It's been a couple months since I worked on it. But um, mm -hmm. that was that was a, a, a good proof of concept, I thought. And I haven't had the time to continue working on it. But um, who knows? A collaborator sent me the I had never emailed you, but a collaborator of mine sent me a link um, or forward, forwarded the email that you sent out to everyone. So I thought I would hop in and I'm surprised at the turnout. I figured there would be like, I don't know, one other person, two people here, but this is not bad. Well, I had no idea. I just said, I'm sending it out. Anybody who wants to come is gonna come and they'll be here and there it is. And I do have issues with the uh, construction of the uh, bytecode machine with the bytecodes themselves. The, um, there are several bytecodes that require um, um, boundary spacing. You have to stick in like two or three bytes if it doesn't fit right. And that pisses me off so badly. It is so stupid. What were they thinking? 
I know what they were thinking. Yeah. Thinking so, <laughs> so one of the, one of the things that's great that ASM does it is it computes like all the frames and, and things for me. So I just stick in like whatever things into the. It's it's, it's essentially a bytecode AST, and I just stick in whatever I want into it, and then it computes all of that annoying stuff, so I don't have to think about it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But BCL did the job, so I suffered. Um, anyway, let's see. Um, I, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing people's names right, but Chirag or Chirag Goyal, are you there? Would you like to tell us what you're up to? I'm not sure if Chirag yes. is. He's, at, he's one of the, oh, there you go, Chirag. Let you introduce yourself properly. Sorry, my video is off because I was tying my eye and I did not want to scare other people with my one foot opening eye. Uh, so I, I work for Undo. Yeah, <laughs> Luckily, um, so I'm an engineer by education. Uh, now I'm in sales, though. I work for Undo. I come from the semiconductor world, where I used to work for Cadence for the longest time, and I've worked as an engineer, a technical executive, a salesperson. So, and I, I love the way uh, you know we're able to utilize the technology, and you know related to the customer uh, issues and you know, how this just unblocks so many pe uh, people at the same time and just increases productivity so much, you know, so you guys thinking in this direction, you know, just gives me so much confidence that, you know, we as Undo also are on the right track and the industry is on the right track. Well, if you so, are actually it, getting people to use it, that's, that was my thing. I had this thing, you know, it, it works reasonably well, actually pretty well, but I could never inspire people to use it. I gave talks at, at IBM and at Microsoft <laughs> and at Sun and at uh, everywhere I could possibly think of. And everybody said, oh, that's a cute idea. And then they went home and wrote print statements. <laughs> what do you think that is, Bill? Yes. And, and it's all in the perspective, right? I mean, it's very difficult for you to communicate to somebody who's been doing the, the job for 30 years that, you know, uh, what we are telling you is totally different from what you were doing. And this is the right way. Uh, so, you know, to communicate that is uh, obviously a challenge. And, you know, I love that. And that's why I think all of us here on the call right now. <laughs> so, great. Yes. Um, um, Thank you so much for the invitation to build to undo. So I could come here and you know uh, understand everybody's perspective on this. Yeah, thanks. So um um well, what's his name? Um, uh, I'm spacing his name. Who 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 wrote Java? Um, I can't think. We of lost our MC. Ah well, anyway. We'll get back to him. Um, why don't we just uh, go on to Stuart? Stuart, you haven't uh, uh, spoken yet. Why don't you tell us what you're up to? Hi there. Yeah, I'm Stuart, Stuart Barnes. I'm another one of the uh, Undo crew who uh, landed here. Uh, I'm a sales engineer and I work with Shirak mainly uh, in the EDA space, so amongst other things. So um, we try and promote our product well formerly C++ and more latterly Java based products to, to folks in the EDA space. Um, it's a pretty neat sort of technology area to be involved with because, you know, it's almost all types of computing is going on there. Um, so it's a good way to sort of stretch out our product, see different workflows, see, you know, different ways in which our product can be uh, used. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's, um, so yeah, I saw your uh, your invite here, and I thought, well, this would be pretty interesting to see who else is out there thinking about these things, and you know what what their experiences are. As someone's already mentioned, trying to get people to use this, you know, it's, it's kind of hard because people's workflows are entrenched, and it takes pretty pretty formidable change of um, attitude to you know change your your basic tooling. But 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 it works so much better. It's so I was sitting. If only that was enough. <laughs> I'm sitting in a coffee shop, and I've got my my laptop, and I'm doing something or other in it. And in walks Gosling and a couple of other other guys, and 
I wave him down. I say, hey, guys, how are you doing? Uh, James, Jamie, let me. And so I show him this thing. And he, you know, spends, oh, five minutes mildly perusing it. And said, oh, that's interesting. He was like, uh, so blasé about it. And I said, how do you do your debugging? He goes, oh, print statements. Yeah, I've heard that one a lot. Definitely, that's familiar. And, and all this is, is just a really, really fancy set of print statements after all. That's really all we're doing. We're just, uh, um, David, welcome. I see you just showed up. Um, we're all talking a little bit about what we're doing. We've got a lot of folks from uh, uh, Undo here and uh, RR and WPI. Um, Welcome. Uh, what are you up to, and how's life? Thanks. Hi. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm. I'm sorry to have missed the beginning. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at Cruise Automation. We work on uh, self-driving cars, um, and I am the manager of a product called WebViz, which is a data visualization tool for robotics data. Um, it's compatible with the robotics operating system, ROS, uh, uh, which most of the self-driving car things at least are compatible with. So what, what WebBiz can do is it takes um, essentially very elaborate print statements, <laughs> uh, a, a log, a, like a time series log file that is output from a, uh, from a robot or from a robot car and uh, and can play them back and visualize them. So if we if we take a car on either a, an actual drive through the streets of San Francisco or on a um, simulated drive, it captures a, a log file and then that log file can be played back in my tool, which has many different ways of looking at that data. But the most important one is a 3D scene that can kind of render uh, all in in the same space, kind of what what the what the car was. I like to say what the car was seeing, thinking, and doing. Uh, so what did it? Uh, what sort of? What were the sensor readings? What were the detections? Yeah. What kind of predictions did it make? All of this is sort of uh, plotted out in, in geometry. Um, and so with uh, uh, so so I, I'm super interested in debugging. You could think about what what people do with my product as debugging. It's not an actual debugger, although I did hack together an integration with LLDB that would allow you to sort of from the REPL send some things out um, to be visualized in our in our tool. Um, uh, but uh, I think the notion of omniscient debugging. So uh, I, I guess you've met uh, JP. Pause. I don't know. Is JP here? It's uh, probably very late for him. I think he's in the Netherlands right now. But JP uh, used to work with me and be a colleague of mine on this product at Cruise, and he introduced me to to this uh, conversation. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, we get to to invest a pretty decent amount of money into developing developer tools uh, at Cruise to make make the uh, the kind of core algorithm developers faster and better at what they do. Um, so yeah, maybe get to bring some of the stuff to life. Well, that is, is way cool. Uh, um, <clears throat> actually, uh, <clears throat> let me inquire. Uh, can I see my hand, this hand? OK, uh, if you could raise your hand, have you seen any of the videos? For example, the uh, speech I gave at Google or at Indiana, are you familiar with those? Okay, uh, really just uh, Ryan that I'm seeing. Okay, um, anyway, um, they're fun videos. And in particular, I wanted to um, uh, tell you that I had, uh, Ryan is going to appreciate this. We have two special guests. And who do you think those guests might be? We're going to see them in their starring roles in just a moment. I'm gonna share on the screen with you because you want me to introduce myself? And I am now going to um, play a little clip, clip because it's fun. Here we are with, well, Yeah. Uh -huh. 
predict that your classes can address problems. This problem on standard great book judges will be able to respond. No. We can't really hear the audio. Oh. I know there is a sharing option with Zoom to pass the audio from your computer. And so that I just wanted to show you that little bit of uh, snake and lizard. That was my shtick when I was doing my talks. And it just made the perfect analogy. And you just pull the tail, right? And you get right to the where the bug happened. And anyway, I'm very proud of that. And I really enjoyed doing it. Um, I thought at the moment that it might be uh, interesting to break, go into breakout rooms. Uh, I thought that if we broke out, say, three people in a room, that would give us a little chance just to talk to each other. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to give us, um, why don't I give us just five minutes in the breakout room? And there's an automatic thing here, which assigns three people per room. And so I'm just going to- Brad, do you want to jump in and intro yourself? Bill? Yes? Can I introduce myself first? Oh, Brad, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I was, I had been so occupied. I, I, yes, please, I'm so embarrassed. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm Brad Myers. I'm faculty at Carnegie Mellon University, and I've been working on various uh, aspects of making programming easier for about 40 years. Um, we had a, a very big project on um, undo and uh, debugging uh, mostly, uh, well, we had a big project on um, debugging uh, around uh, the early 2000s. Um, and the, we did a, uh, a logger for Java that was a complete, and there, you know, a complete logger for everything that happens in Java. But that, we found that was completely insufficient to actually be helpful. It wasn't sufficient just to have what happened. We needed a much better user interface for it. So we developed uh, what we called the wide line, which was a, uh, a way of asking questions about your program. So you could uh, point to an output and say, why did this happen? And it would use static and dynamic analyses to go back and identify uh, what operations uh, caused that to happen, what data values were used, what uh, code was actually on the path that computed whatever it was that you were pointing at. Uh, so the classic example was, you know, uh, and this was mostly in the context of Java GUIs, you would point to say something and say, why is this black? And it would show you where it forgot to get the values from the slider uh, and was just using the default value of zero, um, things like that. So it could uh, take advantage of the logs, but provide a much more uh, higher level interface to them uh, that would answer the questions that programmers had. And uh, even more interesting, we had the ability to answer why not questions. So you could ask, you know, why was this line of code not executed? Or why did this uh, graphic uh, not get redrawn, or why is there nothing in this space? Um, and it would use uh, static analysis in that case to identify the branches that would have had to have taken in order to go down uh, and execute the code that would have made those uh, effects happen. Um, and we had a bunch of visualizations that we designed to help programmers understand what was going on. Um, and the, um, the student who did that uh, is now faculty at the University of Washington. Um, and she had a student who went to work for Apple and took some of this technology with them and claimed that this would be part of the Safari debugger. Um, but I haven't heard 
whether anything ever came of it. So uh, I don't know of any outcomes of that in JavaScript. Um, but we were you know, optimistic for a while that people would be able to see this kind of technology. But so far, uh, it's seen uh, pretty much no uptick. But you know, this idea of being able to ask why questions about your code, you know, everybody really likes that idea because that's what everybody wants to do anyway. But um, it's really uh, hard to get, you know, especially from our location as a research group, you know, actually to get people to accept it. And I think there's a lot more you can do beyond just having those logs and having the ability to execute backwards um, to uh, help people you know, understand the complexities of their systems. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember reading your paper and going through that. Um, wow. And at that same frustration, I was teaching classes using Java, and I was trying to get my students to use the omniscient debugger just to play with it. And they were not in the least bit interested. And that was always a mystery to me. I, it just seemed like such a cool so thing. So I think so Stuart here has, is responsible for you know, training a lot of different, different people across the industry, uh, like a couple industries at least, uh, semiconductors and networking in using this whole technology and you know, uh, getting people to actually drive productivity out of it. So, I mean, we, we've seen the same challenges when we go in, uh, but I, I don't know, uh, Stuart, maybe you want to share how you're able to change them into understanding and using this. In the... yeah, with great difficulty. I guess like, it's a two-step process, right? But the first thing is to get them to use debuggers at all. Never mind if they go backwards or forwards, you know. And uh, you know, a lot, a lot of workflows are really based around either you know uh, dense logging or you know some other kind of ad hoc print uh, printing statement. So, you know, weaning people off that and getting them onto something which is you know an interactive debugger. Um, you know, that's that's kind of a hard first step. Uh, but once people have got into that, you know, it's it's. it's you're kind of halfway there and, and there's an opportunity then to introduce you know this this kind of omniscient style debug environment um and i think i think one of the big things i know is with um with people is that it takes a little while for them to understand what the implications of being able to reverse execute are because it means you can do things in a very different way you know you, you can go let's just go to the crash go to the end have a quick look at the stat trace set a watch point and go backwards that's not something that you can do with the normal debugger and therefore it's not something that really enters into people's minds when they're thinking about debugging a, a problem. So, you know, another one of, another thing that, you know, that we try to um, uh, sort of emphasize is, you know, leave all your previous debug experience at the door. We're gonna show you something a little bit different here. Um, so, and, you know, our experience is once people, you know, see the capabilities, um, they're really on board, you know, is, um, uh, it, it just takes a slight change in, in, in perspective, I think, uh, for people to really, um, you know, get into it. And also one, one more thing I realized is in this process is setting the right expectations because some people think that whatever is being shown to us is gonna solve all my problems uh, in the fastest way possible. And that's something that, you know, set expectations and if they adapt to them, then I think it'll work out. Yeah. I think that sort of mirrors what we've seen too. Uh, there's definitely a set of people out there, a, a surprisingly large set of people who don't use interactive debugging at all, and whose debugging method is basically uh, either either some form of logging, either ad hoc or, or or something maybe a little more structured, or basically permute the code and guess. Um, and, and I'm not talking about like students. I'm talking about you know people who work at name brand companies you've heard of that debug this way, which is a little bit mind boggling to me. Uh, but but I also I also agree with the second half of that assessment. Like once you get them to use an interactive debugger, then when you start layering on, I, I think the idea like, oh, I can go in reverse, that's fairly straightforward people, for people to understand. Um, but the more omniscient thing also does take some time to wrap your head around. Um, 
And so like the idea that maybe instead of setting breakpoints, you just like search for what are all executions of this function and see how they interleave, you know, that's, that's something that, that takes time, especially experience if I can take time for your, your mind to adjust. Uh, Robert O'Callaghan told me he just joined, so maybe he wants to introduce himself since he missed that section. Yeah. Hello, Robert. Uh, hi. Um, hi. Sorry, I'm late. I had a mix up with the time zone. Um, so, um, yeah, I am Robert O'Callaghan. I um, kind of started the RR project at Mozilla, which hopefully you guys have all heard about. And um, I also um, kickstarted Panosco with Kyle and uh, been working on that for a while now. Is that it? Yep. Ask me anything. I think that's good, Doug. <laughs> yeah. Can you put the um, name of your company in the chat? Sure. Okay. Kyle shared a link right up at the start. Pernos.co. Oh, okay. There we go. So yes, as a matter of fact, if if people want to simply put their uh, contact information and whatever uh, you know in the chat, uh, I we we can make I can make I will be copying the chat and sending it out to you. Oh, by the way, Brad, you you're the CMU Brad Myers, right? Yeah. Yeah, you actually. He taught me user interfaces when I was a grad student in the early 2000s, uh, early nine, like mid mid nineties actually. So um, all the all the user interface disasters in Panosco can be can be laid at your feet. I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. Um, Panosco. Doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. Oh. Well, this seems like a fine time. I'm going to do. A breakout group we're going to, let's see, I've got set up for three participants prints per room. And this is just so we get to talk together more, uh, uh, just three at a time. And then we'll get back into the main group in about five minutes. Uh, okay. And there we go. Okay, everybody is in a room. I am going to stay out here and let them talk without me.
A little bit of time without me. <clears throat> okay. No. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Hey guys. Was that a useful thing to do? Yeah, I mean, we could have more time yeah. in our group anyway. That's good news. Uh, so, did uh, in each of the groups, did, did uh, uh, were there any topics that uh, you all discussed that would be really interesting to bring out uh, right now? I think, I mean, one of the things that's really nice, Ryan is a, a real live sort of omniscient debugging user. <laughs> um, so I think it was pretty cool. Uh, we got to, I guess, we're starting to quiz him just on why I think he's, I guess, Ryan, you've given us some pretty reasonable and critical advice as to why this is technology can be hard to adopt. Uh, I don't know if you want to share that. And I think there's, you know, it, it's something we've all kind of picked up on, but I think we're all picking up on it from the perspective of, 
oh my god we all get it why doesn't everyone else get it i think ron you're starting to shed some light on that yeah there are, there can be some adoption difficulties um so I was, I was talking about rr because i do uh julia development at my day job and i love to use julia's integration with rr when the compiler crashes and i want to send a trace to the julia team but there are you know secrets in the code there's keys and there's um uh, data that we have we're making a medical device and that's regulated and we have patient data and i can't send that to the devs either so it's it's sort of in, intrusive because at some point if you could sanitize the trace you sanitized all of the useful potentially useful information out of it and i could try to make a minimum workable example with fake data but for a lot of these bugs i've experienced I could spend a week trying to make a minimum example and not get it because somewhere within our production code are, is just the right setup to make this bug happen. I mean, if you have to spend a lot of time making a small test case, a lot of the, some of the, a lot of the value of omniscient debugging is kind of lost. Right. Um, so that that is a problem. It's not a problem that affects every everyone. I mean, if you can do the um, Debugging. I was going to say at the end of our last conversation. If you can do the, a lot of the debugging in house, then um, it's not so bad. Uh, you know, you can you can kind of deal with that problem. We've uh, run it's into more of a pro it's a problem when you want to translate things. We've run into much smaller versions of that problem. Like, like if you're if you're working in like a you know regulated health data space, like obviously you've got a pretty bad case of uh, of sensitive data. Um, for our little service where people upload their recordings to our cloud, our, our, our worries are usually more like they have invariables in their environment that include like their AWS keys or, you know, things like that. And those, those are a lot easier to sanitize out, I think, if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, right. I can imagine a sanitizer that just, I give it my secrets and it, you know, writes zeros to them or something. Right. Them in some way. But when it's like big chunks, that gets hard. Yeah, when your secret is all the input to the program, then it's a little harder. <laughs> I, I have noticed that um, um, core dumps seem to be a really strong use case. Uh, that's I think that's true inside Cruise, from what I've seen. That uh, um, sort of when when you can reproduce the issue over and over in, in simulation, they're sort of okay with essentially dumping more information out to the file and, and viewing it uh, after a run. Um, but when you have a, a dump and the dump is, and you can't reproduce that, that issue and you need to really inspect it from the dump, then the debugger, um, becomes much more interesting, uh, and actually, and becomes a critical tool. So that, that is right now, I think what is most driving the desire inside crews to be, uh, to like have compatible binaries and be able to consistently load, um, core dumps is, is that well, we find that a decent number of them are not, are not very easy to reproduce and we have to understand them from that file. And that like, you know, that like goes up to, you know, a director of robotics cares about that sort of thing and can actually drive some investment and some adoption. So uh, when I was developing this debugger, um, <clears throat> I think one of my first talks was when, when, when I had a bug in it and somebody said, why don't you debug your debugger with your debugger and um, that promptly became my thing my cute little thing after lizard and snake i would show how the debugger worked here and there and then i would have a dramatic pause and said oh my god there's a bug in my debugger and it was guaranteed no matter where i gave the talk somebody would pop up in the back row and say why don't you and I would very dramatically say, why didn't I think of that? Use the debugger debugger. And then I would proceed to debug the debugger with the debugger and impress them all with, yeah, that's, that's really complicated code and it all works. And you didn't even know it was instrumented it worked so fast. So that was sort of my cute thing. Um, and I, I could not have developed this debugger without this debugger because it's just too damn complicated. This, this, this puppy was really um, involved. There's a lot of, a lot of tricky things in there because you're trying to take a, an object and represent it in a way that is different from the actual object. 
I mean, one of the big things, you know, uh, you can see how I'm showing a, an array back there. That's also how I would show a list. So I would not show the actual list itself. Oh, it's a pointer with a counter to this array, to this other array. No, all you see is a list because that's how you think of it. You think of it as a list. So you get a uh, display which looks like a, um, an array there. And if a value hasn't been set yet, it simply has two dashes. So you know it hasn't been set yet. So that, um, so that when you're displaying it moving through time, you don't want the display to move up and down. There are fewer numbers, there are more numbers in the list. No, you want to see this list, and then you want to see it get populated, but you don't want it to visually change because that really throws you off when you're looking at other things in the same display. So being able to keep it, it as a single thing and watch it get populated and unpopulated. That is you know, one of those complicated things, but it really works well. And of course, the whole point is always, can I find my bugs? Is this effective in debugging? And, and obviously it has been for me, but boy, selling it to other folks has been a challenge. Yeah. I did have I did have folks inside crews ask me about RR. Um, well, there's just just a few, and, and I think that um, it seems to me that debuggers are actually have the most adoption in web browsers, and I think the reason is like the it's an IDE essentially, like it's the whole execution environment and the debugger and the UI that you are debugging is all integrated. And you can click on something on the page and understand it. There's some also some some of like I can kind of usually I have relatively short things that happen on user interaction. So if I need to make them happen, I can kind of make them happen. If I didn't break in the right place, I can just make it happen again pretty quickly. So uh, which you know I guess re re reversible or omniscient debugging should be uh, should a lot should get rid of some of that. Oh my God! Like I break right after. Yeah. Like it took me took me 10 minutes to get the thing to the right point. And then I break right after the interesting part and now I'm screwed. I have to do it all over again. So the backwards is great. People definitely want that, but there's, but there's so much difficulty in just making the whole environment work and keeping it working. Like just, we, we, uh, I'll, again, I'll say at Cruise, there's a guy who maintained a wiki page to, of like, how do I run the stack with GDB? And he had to change it every single time that he did it. <laughs> Like he would go back to his page and he would try to run it and he would find that something had changed and he had to de debug the setup and then fix it and then, and then update his wiki page. But it didn't really matter because next time it would be different. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. You're just screwed if, 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 if the ground under you is changing. To make the debugger actually consistently. Well, I think, I think something you're sort of hitting on there is that the tool is used so infrequently because the value proposition is low relative to the alternatives that then your environment's changed or whatever and it's broken every time you try to use it, right? So there, there's- There was no unit test uh, that made sure that it stayed, that it stayed working. Uh, but that's true, yeah. it was infrequent. Yeah. Some of the problems of integrating an interactive debugger like GDB or even browser dev tools are actually a bit easier when you got record and replay because you know, if you've got some complicated environment that starts lots of processes and and you want to debug one particular one, it's an enormous pain and sometimes impossible to do that with GDB. Whereas um, with something like RR, I think Undo has this as well now, but you can basically just, you just need to insert a wrapper, an RR wrapper, RR recording wrapper at the right place. Uh, and then, you know, some traces will get dumped out at the end without really interfering with anything. And then you can go and debug those. Mm -hmm. And so that gets a bit easier to use uh, in some ways, actually. Uh, obviously, if it depends on the application. Uh, if you, so you, you mentioned that someone asked you about RR. Did that what happened with that? Uh, I'm I I was the wrong person to ask. Okay. <laughs> the well, the fact is, no, there is there are efforts inside of the company to make both GDB and LLDB work consistently, and mm -hmm. they seem to be challenging. Like we've got some pretty smart folks on it, and uh, and it's difficult to get it like consistently working and just get all the 
And I think that it has to do with the fact that like, I think, I think it's to the fact that like it, it may bloat the builds to a point that is like a little untenable. Uh, you're just talking about compiling with debug info. I think that might be, that yeah. might be one of the barriers. That, that is, I mean, yeah, there are tool chain issues there for sure. Yeah. Um, yep. But that's, that's not, ex unfortunately, we don't like, I don't know who has the resources, but it's getting the tool chain issues fixed is challenging. Um, it's not something Another that we want to work on. <laughs> Another issue we've seen in some cases is not so much that just the tool chain craps out, but that it produces inf debugging information that's not useful. You know, if you've ever been in the GDB session and all your variables and your function are optimized out, you're like, yeah, damn it, my is telling what I want to know. <laughs> uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, we did notice uh, one of our customers switched from using GCC to Clang for their builds and like the quality of their debug info plummeted when they did that. Uh, it, it was actually quite bad. So compilers, uh, compilers uh, sometimes give up a little too early on producing useful. I'm curious, I'm curious, Bill, did you run into this with, I guess since you can instrument the JVM, maybe this isn't a problem for you. Maybe it's the only problem for like us, us C++ people. Yes, one of the glorious things about the JVM is you're just working with the bytecodes and the bytecodes will get compiled, I mean, uh, uh, j JIT compiled when it's actually run. So you just throw your junk in around anywhere you see it. It is incredibly simple. You look through the bytecode and say, oh, there is a store. So you just record, I did a store to X at this point. And yeah, so it's incredibly simple, the amount of instrumentation. And then the uh, JIT compiler takes that and compiles it to really, really good uh, code. And it, uh, it's amazing how fast, it is really amazing how fast it is sometimes. Right, okay, that makes sense. Is, uh, is it anybody? Yeah, in our experience, uh, using okay. JavaScript or any other languages besides Java or C, C++. Well, web, web is a web is a web-based tool, so it's written all in in JavaScript. Yeah. But so what is web is uh, sorry web is my the application that I own, which is a visualizer for uh, autonomous vehicle data, uh, and and so it's kind of used as our debugger, even though it's not at all an actual debugger, but it is essentially like very 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 fancy and visual and geometric print, print debugging. <laughs> but are you are you debugging code that's written in JavaScript or is the debugger written in JavaScript? The debugger or the visualizer is written in, in JavaScript. The code, uh, right. okay. the, the car itself is written in C++. Right. So uh, there are two. So they're not here, um, but some former colleagues of ours are working on this thing called replay.io. Um, that you can go find. Uh, it's essentially like a souped up version of Gecko with a record and replay functionality for the JS engine mm. and the DOM. Um, so there is some stuff in that space. Robert and I have also built uh, extensions for our tool that understand how the V8 JavaScript engine works and can back out essentially what the state of the VM was, what JavaScript it was executing um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you can, if you turn off the JIT, because the V8 JIT's pretty, pretty, uh, I don't know what the right word is, uh, good at JITing maybe, uh, pretty complicated. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, if you turn that off, you could, you could actually debug JavaScript inside and then our tool and we've gotten like a compatible version of V8 and whatnot. Hmm. Uh, Brad, if you're looking for others, um, Rev debug is a .NET reverse debugger worth taking a look at. Um, I know there's an ancient Java project, Chronon or Chronos, Chronon, I think. Chronon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's definitely other other bits of it out there. There's been a number of JVM. There's been a number of JVM adjacent things in various states of disrepair at this point. Uh, but it, but it's definitely something people have tried multiple times with the JVM. So I, I'm working with VHDL, that's another language, but there, there you have the RTL simulation where you basically see everything what happens, but it's but you don't know anymore the, the, the relationship between the different waveforms you get there, because basically 
the number of of, of squiggly lines, and and then and, and then you may need to make sense what, what why one line changes and then something else changes, and and perhaps also or, or also for that kind of thing, especially if you if, if you create these by by HLS the, the the VHDL code, you would probably would like at least to see from the original C input or C plus plus input. What was the meaning now in, in 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 the RTL, and then perhaps get some traces why this changed, and this was some kind of condition evaluation, and that's why we changed this register and such. Such thing that would probably also be really nice. Yeah, I hear you, James, because I used to work at Cadence, and for the longest time, from spec to 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 GDS, you know, all the steps would require that same simulation to be run again and again, over and over, to compare if any of those constraints are. Any of the changes have changed anything. If it, it's just a wire with their, uh, you know, register and capacitors messing up together. So I mean, I totally hear you. And even at Undo, some of our customers are from that domain, and we've seen how they've been able to essentially uh, reproduce some of those things. And something that Kyle was also talking about uh, the the differentiation that you can create between the the working version and the non-working version kind of gives you that insight and the data drivenness to kind of actually go and. Uh, look at this from a proper uh, process rather than the guesswork of what you're doing. Yeah, and if you start using, I, I, I tried model sim and, and then just diff with the model to build in diff to diff two different traces, simulation traces, and then then but it's still it. Then you get such a, a big amount of data you are overwhelmed by you don't even know where to start looking. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Well, um, we're, we're here, we, we've chatted a bit. Um, are there things that uh, people might want to do? You, we've kind of met each other. We kind of know uh, what we're doing. Um, I will send out the recording and I will send you the um, uh, stuff in the chat. Um, I guess one thing I'm interested in is um, what sort of um, visualizations people have found useful in debugging with omniscient debuggers. I mean, um, we've tried some things in Panosco. Uh, if you look at it, I don't know, if you, I don't know how many of you guys have seen our, our, our document, our, feature pages the about page i think carl linked to it earlier i linked it before you joined i don't know if people i've seen people seen that before this meeting or not but we can see there a few things that we've tried to do uh one of the challenges that we've found is there are a huge number of cool things we could do with all the data we have but we don't really know which ones are on the critical path to making debugging better if you know what i mean like Many cool things you could do probably turn out to be not that useful once you really have a good approach to omniscient debugging. Um, I know Brad's done some work in this area, um, but uh, I don't think we have that much experience with some of these things. So I was kind of curious if any of you guys have got like cool cool things that you know are really useful, um, cool that that you can't do without omniscient information. I've, things that I I believe would be useful. But not that I know are useful. Do you want to share some of your guesses? I have been interested. So so again, kind of with with the my tool, we're looking at things after the fact. I guess in in some way you could imagine, I, and I'm a little bit um, fuzzy on even what omniscient debugging is. But my sense is sort of like you know you, you take an execution trace and then you explore it instead of like instead of actually executing the program and stopping along the way. Right? Is that a basic? Uh -huh. I think I think the yeah. best way to describe it would be, you know, if you imagine a GDB, you're stopped at one particular point in time. Uh, imagine if you could design an interface without the limitation of only looking at one point in time. Yeah. Okay, so so WebViz views a kind of an execution trace. It's not nearly such a like comprehensive execution trace as uh, as would be done sort of it if you instrumented at the debugging level at the sort of like syntax, you know, syntax tree level or whatever, but the uh, or the the bytecode level. But what it does have is it has sort of, uh, you know, at every, um, a robot operates kind of in, in ticks, right? It's sort of an event loop. 
And so it has like a lot of the inputs and outputs of lots of the different processes that operate on every tick. So it has like something approaching uh, uh, a, a, an execution trace. And, um, the, and so, you know, the most useful, the, the, the primary thing that people do with it is they look at plots. Uh, and mostly plots. they look at line, line plots over time. That's that's what they mostly mostly care about is they want to know you know okay at what point did we start to think that this thing was moving at mm. what point did we start to think that this thing would intersect our path at what point did we um, did we decide to send a break signal uh, and and then I want to look at all those things lined up right so um, so that's what that that is the kind of stuff that that is the majority of what people are interested in. And even other, we have lots of other uh, kind of views of data. They are more interesting when you look at one point in that plot. So, okay, now I'm looking at, at I, I look at the plot to find out kind of where along the drive did something interesting happen? Did we see something change about the, the, the object that we were tracking? And then I want to say, okay, like at that moment, what was going on? Did we have any diagnostic signals? Did we have any, um, like, did we did we have uh, any late information from one of the sensors, or uh, you know, what 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 is the full range of paths that we were considering? Did we have some cost, some hysteresis cost in our planner? All these kinds of things that you might look at. Uh, they're more looking at a moment, but really, plots <laughs> plots get us a long way. And I keep thinking about other kinds of things that we might want to show, like oh, when do things like we're just like an event timeline. And really, people are like, ah, I can just make a plot that shows when the events occur, and, you know, ticks to one and then back down to zero or something like that. So it's line plots all over the place. Sometimes Do you think that's specific to your domain? Because we don't see that kind of uh, desire from, say, browser developers. So, uh, well, okay, I can imagine with browser developers, and you know, because I am a browser developer, that uh, what I care about a lot of times is like uh, is like network interactions and, and order of events, mm -hmm. right? It's still I guess it's still a timeline, but it's uh, I want to know like did this did the save finish before or after the user clicked the other thing or yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the order of events yeah so but that's that is a little bit of a different visualization it would be sort of more of a Gantt charty kind of thing I'm not sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The sort of stuff that we get again when, when we do traces in the browser and we do um, things like performance traces or we do network traces, what we see is a lot of these bars moving across this across a timeline. So I guess it's always it's, it tends to be timeline, but it is amazing how much you can get out with a plot. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Cool, thanks. By contrast, um, most of my work, of course, <coughs> is debugging. I mean, all of it is a debugging Java programs, of course. So it's a, just looking at the algorithm. And pretty much all of my debugging is, oh, I threw a null pointer exception. Where did I throw the null pointer exception? Oh, n is null. Why did why is n null? Okay, who passed n from the previous function? Oh, why did n get you know, it really is that, that snake thing. It, it, most of my debugging is just one, two, three, four, ah, here is why it got set to null, and oh, and that's it. So it is almost always, like almost all of my bugs really are just following straight back with no questions, it's obvious. Why is x zero? X is zero because it was set to zero over here because something else happened, and you just yep. step directly backwards, and you get to the point and say, oh, "There it is." So that's my experience. Kind of a dependency. Why I do what I do. One yeah. thing I am a little bit curious about because this isn't really a domain I have any experience with um, in the car case. Like, do you have, um, you know, you talk about how you have these events or ticks or whatever. Do you persist a lot of state between them? Like you remember this thing is over there, it's heading in this direction, so we expect to see it there? Or do you sort of reobserve the world from scratch every time? And and do you find like if you do have a lot of persistent state, do you find that like this persistent state goes wrong and then you follow it forwards, like like Bill saying he does in his Java program? There's a lot of persistent state. 
one of the challenges is reproduction of issues. You know, I mean, like, oh, we have to start <laughs> accumulating some state from before the issue happened, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sure that the state goes wrong. I'm sure that it does. The state is not super long lived. Like, I don't think it's, you know, for instance, you wouldn't care um, like a minute later what was happening, what was happening a minute ago is kind of kind of old news right. when you're driving a car. Right. So it's only on the hand, you know, on a handful of seconds kind of, um, uh, yeah, time frame. But yeah, it does, I'm sure. So let me think about, uh, I'll, I'll take some time to think about like w what happens when that state gets corrupt and you need to understand why. Yeah, I was just, I was just sort of curious whether, cause we talked earlier about how yours was sort of like a batch processing kind of thing. I'm just curious whether it's more like, I have this weird set of input that produces this wrong output at this one point in time, or whether it's I slowly build up this wrong model of how things are going, because that's how a lot of like, you know, bugs and build software program or bugs and for example, web browser typically work is, you know, I corrupted something and down the line, it's gonna, you know, kick my legs out from underneath me and I'm gonna trip and fall. Yeah, I think that the amount of state is probably low, like in terms of the overall kind of memory of the system. And therefore okay. it's kind of mostly, you mostly kind of like keep it around and, or, or you like kind of, kind of store it at least. So the way that a, the way that a robotics system works uh, is that it has many different, it's a processing graph and they, they work with message passing. So you get, you get sort of messages in from sensors and then you have nodes that process those messages. They sort of have a, a strategy for how to synchronize messages from multiple different places and decide like how often they're going to produce new messages. And that just happens down through, you know, hundreds of notes um, as they sort of process things and move them forwards. And eventually something sort of triggers an actuator and then, and then you do it again. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of that state is like that message passing architecture allows us to, to persist state along the way, because it basically is serialized at every, at every boundary. Um, so that's kind of an interesting architecture that allows us to um, do similar thing that, that I guess you can do with RR, which is sort of, we've already essentially wrapped every single one of these little processors with something that captures the inputs and outputs and understands them and can record and replay them and things like that. Hmm. I just realized that I uh, don't actually have everybody's email address. So if I'm going to send you a, a pointer to this, um, if you put your email address into the chat, I will be able to send something to you. Um, when I was at FMC in 1984 or so, we were working on autonomous vehicles, of which we're not quite as elaborate as the stuff that you're working on, David, but uh, because it was FMC, we did not do go-karts like those cheap ass uh, universities did. We were FMC. We used a Bradley fighting vehicle for our example vehicle. And every now and then, you know, we get lost and we go, and it was so much fun to be at these trials because we'd be going, hey, Bill, I didn't see a hay bale. Did you see a hay bale? <laughs> Just run right over them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <yeah>, anyway. <laughs> um, anything else somebody wants to bring up or talk about while we're still here? A potentially slightly commercial thing, so I'm going to let you guys veto if, but we've all spent a good amount of this call going, oh my God, we can't get anyone to unify and, and adopt this stuff. And we've heard terms like omniscient debugging, reverse debugging. I'm sure there are a bunch of others. Apologies if I missed off of them. I feel like there's a point and I, I'm coming at this from the salesperson, like you walk into a room and you say, do you need a static analysis tool? And every, every engineering manager in the world goes, yeah, of course we do, but we already have X, Y, or Z. There's a point, and I don't think it necessarily is soon, where 
we're going to be able to walk into room and be like, you know, what's your emission debugger of choice? Or, you know, oh, you're on the Java platform. That means you must be using the emission debugger or, you know, whatever it is. And I think part of this is as simple as potentially groups like this getting together and being like, what, what are we actually trying to do here? Like, are we all trying to do the same thing? And if we are, let's call it the same thing so that everyone can find us. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that's interesting. I mean, I know, I know the Panosco guys, you guys are looking at potentially monetizing and I don't know if it's something you guys are interested in thinking about, but it's something I'd genuinely love to chat with a wider group about if, if there's interest in the future. My, my, um, my experience before Cruise was at a company called Alation, which, is, which, which made a product that we ended up deciding to call a data catalog and Alation, I started, I was the eighth employee at Alation. We, we hired uh, a woman who had already uh, um, launched two different product categories in the enterprise data space before she joined our, our company and, and at our company. We, we think, I think we have a pretty good claim to say that we launched a third, uh, or, you know, in her career, we launched a, a, a new product category. We called it data catalogs and we got a lot of other people <laughs> one to start building them or start naming their products that thing and start buying them at the end of the day. Um, so I, I have gotten to witness this process once of sort of like, how do you create a new product category and, and then get like, you know, BMW and, uh, and Salesforce and LinkedIn and all these companies to buy it. <laughs> Uh, and so it is, it's a challenging process, but I, what I found out was that it was all, so the interesting thing was when we were hiring our first VP of marketing, I had this idea of all the things that she was going to do. And she came in and she did none of those things. She did completely different marketing activities than I expected because I was thinking about consumer products and like brand marketing and stuff like that. She came in and she did enterprise marketing, which is like analyst relations, really, mostly. There are people out there who advise other people on what they need in order to build a great tech organization and in order to build technology at scale. And they tell people you need a, you need an omniscient debugger. And that's the, uh, yeah, that's how. It so one thing, one thing that I think is tough, especially for the direction that we're approaching it from and that Undo's approaching it from is there is sort of this burgeoning space of like observability tools. Uh, things like honeycomb.io and new relic and that sort of stuff that approach a lot of the same platform or a lot of the same problems, at least for like a different kind of platform, but like the implementation details are radically different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we were talking earlier about how, you know, some people use interactive debuggers, some people use these like fancy or maybe not so fancy logs. Uh, and the companies in this space are way out on the fancy log side uh, of this argument, um, which, you know, I would like to convince people not to do that, but <laughs> that's just me. Um, so I, I think it's tough because like, it's, you know, there's, it's, it's a big space of like, how do you solve problems essentially? Like that's, that's the space we're sort of in and, and, you know, there's, there's different approaches to it. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know how you convince people like, like you said, walk into a room and be like, Oh, what's your, you know, insert buzzword X of choice, and this is why it should be us. Um, but you know, it's kind of a diverse space already, so well, uh, it seems seems challenging. The example that you led that was that was led with about static analysis is interesting because obviously there's lots of different static analysis tools that do radically different things. So asking right. someone like, are you, you know, what's your static analysis story is like what's basically you're asking like what's what's your software story? <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's a very very broad question. Um, so if, you know, it's, it's kind of weird to me. Um, I think, uh, we could maybe define, if we're going to, if we were going to define a category, it would have to be narrower than that, I think, to make any kind of sense. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's totally fair. Um, I, it's one of these things, cause I think like, what, what are we all doing? We're all doing some form of dynamic analysis, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, right, exactly. Right. An emission debugger and what David's doing and what you guys are now starting to do in Panosco is, is there's, there's enough variance there. Are I, you? Have, um, I have some friends at a, at a company called Backtrace IO. I'm not sure if any of you have heard yeah, of Yeah, I know we know those yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's, another, that's another one. Uh, they're, they're decently successful. You know, I don't know. They're not, they're not a billion dollar company yet, but they are, they're, they've managed to get like some, you know, the PlayStation Group and like Spotify and a bunch of these companies to invest in their stuff. 
And, and I think that that's because for them, it's all about like, it's not about um, like developer productivity. It's about, mm. it's about reducing faults in production right. and reducing the time to, to recover. Yeah. Um, I think those are compelling. Methods. We have they also, from our, from our, our discussion with them, they focus pretty heavily on like the product manager or application owner perspective of like, you know, this is all the shit that's broken in your product and this is how we're going to categorize it and, and get it to your engineers in an effective way. Yeah, it's all agile development focus, very uh, agile development focus kind of a thing. Uh, you do sprints and you, know, you decide which ones to fix, which ones not to fix based on what they can. Yeah. Um... I think we have heard from many sources that targeting production and ops type level stuff will be much more profitable. <laughs> um, and I'm not, I can't say they're wrong about that. <laughs> um, so that is an interesting point. I mean, RR doesn't really, is not a great fit for production workloads because of the overhead. Um, and so we haven't, it, 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 for some customers it could work. Uh, but that's not really a market that's easy for us to target. So, and it's not where we've put our focus. But I think that there is, I think there is space for someone to try to build a, a record and replay, a, a significantly lower overhead record and replay system. I think there's technology, there's a technology, there's technology opportunities that no one's tried yet. And I think there's a market opportunity there. If you can get something that really works well for, production systems i think that'd be really interesting to do google it's just not cloud. what we've done google cloud has this thing called google cloud debugger that yep. seems to seems to have taken that approach is like i i can i can install the the library in my code and i can deploy it and it can run in production with that with low overhead yeah but then i can sort of say uh ooh, like can, can i like have like some sampling of my machines or yep. just one of them capture a trace once in a yeah. while. So. It, it's sampling based. It won't It won't give you the ability to re... As far as I understand it, uh, from what I've read about it, is it sampling based. So it doesn't give you the ability to replay the execution with full fidelity, yeah. which I think is something we want to do. Yeah. But certainly, my, certainly, my, understanding, yeah. my understanding is the non-core dump parts of backtrace.io are also sampling based, essentially. Right. Uh, and that seems to work well enough for them, you know, so. Makes sense, right? Those are good techniques. But yeah, but like, that's not, that's not the tool rocket I set out to build, right? So that's kind of the problem there. <laughs> like if that, if that tool really does solve 99% of the problem, then we're, then we're in trouble. <laughs> I wonder if you, you could essentially just, if you could do this thing that says like, all right, install it, set up the machinery, but only, but I can sort of like mm. send a signal to one of my servers to say, hey, can you start capturing this stuff? Like I won't affect most of my production fleet. Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, you can, in fact, already in some like for some customers, you can already do that with RR. You could say, you know, run 90 90 your servers normally, and then run one server with RR on it, and then um, see what happens. Um, and then, the, yeah, you could you could improve that so that you can dynamically attach recording to something. It's theoretically possible. Um, so that sort of stuff could be done. It's just you know a direction that would have more work. Yeah, I. I I will say I'm doing the same. I'm I'm having the same uh, experience as a as a like tool manager inside of Cruise. Is that all of the organizational pressure is to say like um, let's like let let's diagnose things either either on the road or in simulation, and not really talk and they're really thinking about like how do, how long does it take to kind of to, to uh, like understand what really happened and then fix it and then fix a problem out, out essentially in production, a lot less kind of, uh, it's harder for me to, for instance, like write a prom promotion packet for myself based on, I made developers, yeah. um, iteration speed a little bit faster. It's just right. not, it's not really what the managers are asking me for. It's not what the, the sort of the executives are asking for. I, I, we, we had a principal science, research scientist show up who was like, well, I had better tooling at a different company in this particular area. And so I would be willing to like put my principal name <laughs> as a sponsor for this kind of a thing. And that's kind of the best way that I think I'm finally going to be able to think about debugging and local development as a, as a place to invest our efforts as opposed to diagnosis of road events. 
Yeah, I'll definitely say like on the sales kind of side of it, like we improved your developer productivity 10% is essentially impossible to sell because nobody measures developer productivity in any meaningful way. Uh, so like, you know, there, there are these classes of things we couldn't fix before that now we can like that, that's much more effective than the, the generic, like I made everything a little bit faster, even if that's exactly what like on the debugging would obviously do to somebody who's, who's used to it. I mean, it varies because companies are spending money internally on tools that improve their developer productivity by s small percentages. Um, but they're not willing to pay us for some reason. <laughs> well, so this is, I guess, I guess back to that question about like creating a product category and then at some point convincing people that like, A, yeah. you know, that if best practices includes using this product. Right. It's kind of like, oh, wait, hold yeah. on. We have some kind of like, uh, we got slow development and the PMs are always saying like the developers don't get us the features fast enough. And why, oh, yeah. wait, you don't have, uh, you, you don't have the right suite of tools in here. Like you don't. I agree. Thing. I don't have observability and and you can't just tell everybody this you have to start by getting a few people who are visionary to do it and then you get other people to tell their stories and then you get them writing this paper that says like everybody who's anybody has, has yeah that, that takes a really long time to do this I mean I, th I think you're exactly right I mean it's cultural and if you look back not that long ago people would have thought you were crazy for paying for source control <laughs> but, everybody, but everybody does that now yeah it just took hold and and you know what are the um, what are the success stories like i'm curious who's you know for undo and for Nasco and rr even what are sort of like the top success stories that we have i'd be curious to learn from them um well for right. most for panosco we have been selling i don't know if i'm technically supposed to tell you this i, I guess i will um we've been selling it to mozilla out here who we used to work for um and uh, and they've been using it. And I think there's, we've got tons of positive feedback from us little developers, um, and um, and they pay us some money, which isn't enough to to live on, but is more than it costs to run the service. Um, so um, so that's been really successful from a sort of I yeah, think, users actually do want I, this stuff. I, I think the feedback from them has been like the category of stuff it's most useful for is. I'm poking around in this complicated code I don't understand, and I'm trying to retrofit in this new feature, and things don't behave in the way I expect them to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sort of need to tease out like all the interactions between this stuff. That seems to, that and like just the generic like you know crazy memory corruption you know bullshit that you would expect in a C plus plus program. I mean, um, it's complicated. There's a lot of. I think it's pretty broad. I don't. I wouldn't want to give the impression that there's a there's a certain there's a few categories of things that dominate. Um, for example, someone just yes, like Emilio just yesterday um, talked about how debugging IPCs was much easier with Panosco. That's true. Um, so there's a variety of things. Um, with RR, for RR, I, there's, there's a lot of different users, but we don't have great telemetry or feedback channels. I mean, you know about the, we already mentioned the Julia integration. So I guess you'd call that a success that the Julia people went out and did that and I think they thought it was worth doing and, and they've been using it. So, um, yeah. Pernasco is a web based yeah. service, so we know everybody who's using it, which is really nice. Um, RR yeah. is like open source and distributed with Linux versions, Linux distros rather, and so we really have no idea who's using it. Um, but we do get interesting bug reports, we do get bug reports from interesting people every now and then. Um, and so, so sometimes we learn interesting things like, oh, look, the QEMU guys are using it, or oh, look, people at this company are using it, or whatever. Uh, based on bug reports about how stuff's broken, uh, so that that's kind of an interesting insight. Interesting. I just shipped a feature with a bug, a known bug, just to make sure to see if anybody noticed. <laughs> we haven't done that yet, but you know, maybe we don't need to intentionally do that. We didn't. We didn't put it in. It just I was decided not to fix it before we. Should. All right. <laughs> no, David. Is it on the on D side? Um, you've had, um, I mean, like, I think like Shirag and Shirag mentioned the EDA kind of, at, well, I guess it's a space that Jens is in, um, space. We've had a lot of wins. We've kind of pretty much acquired that market, um, but in, in very differing forms. So like, you know, we've got sort of the, the not enough money to live on as a developer tool, 
you know it's we've, we've you know like sort of hundreds of users in some of these organizations where we're making the money is i think exactly what uh robert said it's the production environment so there are i don't know probably five or six eda products out there on the market who are licensed to ship our tool to their customers and flick a switch and make a recording on customer site and deliver something home and you know and they're willing to pay you know significant dollars on an annual basis for that so that was kind of our first like big beachhead but I, what's interesting it's it's long processing times it's often batch mode processes that you don't interact with um and um you know it, it, i think if and i guess the other thing about eda is they're shipping you know the bleeding edge you know their customers uh apple and samsung and whatever they're demanding i don't care if it's not perfect ship me the newest simulator so i can get on with my projects um and so they know they're shipping with tons of known defects and they know they're going to have to resolve them because when mm. apple says resolve an issue you do it otherwise you lose hundreds of millions of dollars or something um so that's that's been our those of our kind of biggest wins um but it's been i think we've kind of we've got two really big networking companies on the books right now that's all in their test environments that's all as a kind of you know and, and these are you know the way in was kind of through that development organize or the sort of development operations organization and it, it is around like you know selling maybe not 10 percent better productivity but you know are you fixing bugs faster what kind of issues have you had open and it's we were super lucky they had a an open ticket that had been open for five years and we fixed it in two hours and like obviously it, they weren't working on it for five years but mm. you know if we walked in we did that and we said like how many of those have you got floating around and that's a really compelling productivity story it's not minutes it's a lap we had we had we had a so, similar experience with one potential client that we were working on where um, I walked in to do a demo and we were trying to record something and we couldn't quite get the right thing and we picked up something else instead. Um, and then, you know, we spent an hour and a half debugging and it. it turns out to be this like memory corruption they've been trying to track down for four months or something like that. And at the end of the demo, the guy's like, hey, this other team needs to talk to you because we think that's this bug they've been looking for for like months. So they they want to know some more details. You know, it's pretty great. Yeah. Um, so it's, I mean, it's interesting because I think like there is hope selling into that, and I think we've we've done the same thing. Like we have an overhead, so there's no way we're going to be in production networking systems or database data management systems. But we have we've now got customers in in both of those spaces. It's been it's been a hell of a fight. It's been long eval processes. It's been like you know playing whack a mole with performance issues amongst other things and and getting hundreds of stakeholders on board. But it, it's Good. kind of been doable. Glad to hear. So yeah, I guess there, there's definitely kind of hope. I don't, you know, we're not we're not yet. As I say, we're not sat in our mansions yet. So like, there's a hell of a long way to go uh, for us. But, but yeah, we we do have some of those customers, which is which is uh, yeah, is nice to see. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there's anything. Other, that's the main stuff. I guess yeah, the other thing that's worth noting though is because I think we're all talking about workflows and how complicated they can be to set up. Mm -hmm. um, COVID has killed that like we know to run an effective evaluation we need to get in front of our customers and do some basic plumbing in just so that they have a delightful experience and trying to do that in this environment is bloody difficult and it's why we've gone you know you can go and download a version of just our simple reverse debugger on the website because we just need a new way that we can get our tool into people's hands to try it out so i think this is a super challenging time for this tech and i think like usability is one of the things I'm pushing my engineering team is like, how do we, how do we make this jump out of the box and, and get easy to use in, in seconds, not days. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a really challenging time right now. And it's going to be interesting to see how I say, I don't know how our engineering team's going to handle it. And I'm super, I mean, watching all of you guys to see how you do as well. I mean, uh, uh, one thing that we've gone through is, um, we started with the idea that we would try to sell to big customers, I guess, like Undo has been doing. Um, and there's some good reasons to try to do that. But it's been really difficult um, for lots of the reasons we've talked about. And one of the things we heard from someone at Backtrace, actually, uh, was that um, selling to individual developers has its downsides, but has different kinds of downsides. And it's worth trying. So. Um, we are working on that, so pretty soon we will announce um, you know, 
a, a way for individual users to just um, use Panosco to make RR recordings and then use Panosco to debug wow. uh, that stuff and take advantage of the, the omniscient interface and the collaboration stuff that we provide. Um, so we'll see if it'll be interesting to see if that moves how, how much that moves the needle. Um, that is something that we're working on. I'll share another kind of insight from, from my experience at Alation. Alation sold a data catalog, and a data catalog is it's kind of like a really fancy wiki for your databases. But um, one of the things that worked pretty well for Alation is that we also had a, a SQL uh, editor environment that was like a web-based SQL editor that was connected to that data catalog. So it would kind of like show you documentation about your uh, about your queries and about your tables as you kind of clicked on mentions of them in your SQL and stuff like that. It was, this was my baby, this was my tool. And uh, the, the value, the enterprise value was in the catalog. That was how you convinced them to spend, like people would spend, the companies would spend $2,000 per year per seat for this, these tools. Our, our average contract values were like in the, you know, uh, hundred to two hundred thousand dollar a year kind of range um and the uh and the value the reason that they were willing to spend that kind of money was because they knew that they would sort of like have this store of knowledge and information that was in this catalog but what really spread it <laughs> was the was the individual developer experience of having this tool open and using it every day all day long and actually, it was also collaborative, so you could like send a link to a query, yep. right? Oh, that's really mm -hmm. nice. So I feel like there might be some opportunity. I don't know. I'm trying to strategize for your stuff. Yeah. So we have we have some interesting stuff, kind of like that, actually, um, that you mentioned in our product. So because it's a web tool, you know, you could just send the links to your colleagues. We also have ways for you to take notes and stuff. So you can like have the QA person, somebody from the QA team, uploads a recording of this defect or whatever and links it to the appropriate issue in your issue tracker. And then like some random person could come in, take a look at it. You know, they debug it, they get to some point and they're like, Oh, this is this other team's problem or, Oh, like, I don't quite know what's going on here. And they can annotate it with notes and, you know, toss it over the wall, ask like, Hey, is this supposed to be happening here? And, you know, get yes or no answers, you know, kind of things like that. Um, and I think from our feedback that hasn't been like, uh, it's not something people use every time, certainly, but when it's useful, it's really useful. Yeah, we WebBiz is a WebBiz is a port to the web of our of this tool called Arviz that is open source and part of the Ross ecosystem. It's, it's plus a bunch of other stuff, but it started out as that, and the basic reason was like, hey, you want to send links to other people that says, here's exactly what I'm looking at. Uh, it's a big deal, <laughs> but there's there's link sharing that allows it to you know go viral, and that's kind of a cliche, but it but it's true um, to go viral. And then but then there's also this like store of knowledge over time, uh, which I guess sort of you and is is Jira in the case that you're talking about here, which you know another pretty successful tool that says like all right, I need a place that has every issue that I've ever run into and and, and allows people to track whether they're moving through the system and all this stuff. Uh, but I bet there's there's something similar, uh, if if only like uh, an augmentation of Jira. With that. We don't typically see people going back and accessing like really old traces or recordings. Although it happens occasionally. But one thing, you know, we were talking in that breakout session about that differential debugging thing. I think if you could do that, you know, that would dramatically increase the value of having that stored, uh, that knowledge of how like the program's supposed to behave in this situation. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm, that's a good great point. Understanding where they where they diverge is pretty awesome. Well, I think that we have had a successful evening. Um, it seems like it's probably a good time to call it a success. Are there any final thoughts before we? Uh... I would be curious if you end up doing stuff with visualization at either at either. Uh, any of the folks who are working on this stuff, I'd be curious to see it. Uh, it's kind of where my rubber meets the road in my, my use cases. Okay, well, I will include everybody's email and everything. Definitely. And, um, yeah, coming in. No, just thank you very much, everyone. It's been really, really interesting. Yep. Really appreciate yeah, thanks, it. guys. Thank you so much for sorting. Yeah, thanks for the, yep. yeah, thanks for the discussion. 
See ya. And thanks, thanks for putting this together, Bill. In my honor, with a real pleasure. Take care, go out and do great things. Uh,